Th thanks so much for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, um, it's actually a J on on the on the slide. We are not stupid, but apparently we have a corporate font that does not print a J, and we need to lose uh, use a image logo for our own corporate. And now the image is gone completely. That's brilliant. Excellent. I just try to turn it off and on again. So you should see a slide uh, with the four most dreaded words on, on the internet these days. I think we improved our app these days. It's kind of horrific. And uh, why is this so? A couple of discussions I had during the conference already. Um, we are under a lot of pressure as developers and engineers to deliver more and not less features every day. Um, I'm a big fan of maintaining stuff and not having to deliver new things at every day, but reality is different and we have to do this more and more frequently and obviously quality and, and robustness suffers to some extent. So today's agenda, I'm going to start with my stake in this. We briefly speak about mocking and I probably should have added a bullet point about end-to-end -end testing uh, there as well. And then we take a short trip into the dark ages down to memory lane and learn how Spring Boot declarative configuration, Docker and containers improve this stuff quite a bit. And I will then speak about a topic that's near and dear to my heart uh, about embedded testing. So everything in this talk is about testing bigger components that you speak to from your application. Think about databases, um, event stores, messaging systems and the like. Some of them can be embedded uh, and this is helpful or not, we will see. Then we bring in the Wayne in the room, test containers, and wow, time flew. It's already five years since Quarkus entered the scene and brought a bunch of fresh ideas to the whole thing. And we will finish then with how Spring Boot did involve. So I work for Neo4j. We produce a graph database with the same name. Um, I have to say, sorry, no AI today, um, but uh, Neo4j has a couple of things literally in store, pun intended. We can do a uh, proper vector index store. We, um, we, can, they, we, we make uh, embeddables searchable. We have a nice graph data science library. Um, I think our database is a good start for building REC application, retrieval, argumented, generative AI. And we have a lot of content out there. Feel free to check this out. Uh, slides are already shared with the link that come back later. And that also works great with Spring AI and Olama models in, well, test containers. I'm um, going to share this later, but that's not the topic of today, sorry. So my stake in this, um, I was asked for a, a kind of a slogan for, for this conference. They made us a nice um, customized t-shirts and I said query languages are not an offense. I've been a database guy for more than 20 years, worked in a small Oracle shop, we started with client server applications and integration testing back then was super nice and easy. We were like, yeah, stuff generated works approximately fine. And then we gave it to testers. They had their, their sheets with the numbers, could compare things, all good, easy. Fine life, also made money. Things got wild with Java, Spring, and ORMs. I mean, even we couldn't stop time, went on the enterprise, and you got this whole object mapping thing. And you really need to think from that perspective, what do I want to test here? Do I want to test the queries the object mapper are generating? I, syntactically, I hope not, because that's why I'm using an object mapper with generated queries. But I want to test performance. I want to test semantics if my queries depend on a lot of inventory data, so to speak. And then don't get me started when you write custom queries. I'm a big fan of custom queries always. Use a database, your store the way it's meant to, not a library that needs to have a common baseline, thinks it should be used. Something funny happened then. I got hired by Neo4j. Quite the opposite world. Um, graph database, different query language, Cypher is its name. And I'm actually working on an OGM now. So OGM is quite the same. Like an ORM, the G stands for graph mapping software. And together with my friend and colleague, Garrett Meyer, I'm one of two maintainers of the Spring Data Neo4j module. Now I'm at a point where I am the one generating all the queries, so I need to test their syntax on correctness. I could use our parser, 
but that parser is different throughout different versions of the database. I also need to be able to test the runtime and integrations with our drivers and products. That leaves me with a multifaceted test matrix. I need to test against different versions of the product. I need to test against different versions of our driver. Um, that can be quite a big pain. And that was actually the reason why we introduced, why we actually created the Neo4j test containers module. This is mostly the point where I would ask, are there test containers users out there? Anyone already using test containers? One, two? Are there some of them? That's good. Um, we come to this later. Um, yeah. So the short piece about mocking. Um, this is about integration testing. And what I perceive as integration testing is actually integrating against the upstream component or downstream component, whatever. Not about mocking away that piece of code. I actually want to test the interaction with, with a different module. Um, I'm totally happy to apply mocking for anything that happens on top of it when I have good coverage of the integration, right? Um, in my work, I do a lot of mocking for the mapping stuff we are doing. It's easy enough to shape a record so that it looks like something that came back from a database. Um, I can do this in isolation. I would rather not mock away the whole product I'm required to use for my own stuff. Actually, we had a couple of involuntary regression tests. Um, we, we found by testing our Spring Data module quite a couple of bugs, actually. So this is, was kind of funny. So as I said, memory lane. Anyone remembers a dialog that went approximately like this, oh, did you just nuke my test data? I do shared test servers. It's not as much fun as it sounds like. It was really a long time ago, one of many of those things. Um, doesn't matter what's in detail, it's one persistence XML, and we used to share these things around like 20 years. There was one big beefy test server in it, test database, um, shared credentials, of course, and everything attached to it. Um, tests running at the same time, getting invalid test results and all of that. Things got eventually better, and I gave a similar talk already eight years ago. I'm, I know that containers and Docker is, is more than just testing, but it's always, for me, associated to some extent with that. Um, yeah, at that time, I just fired up the Docker Maven a plug-in as it was the way of the time. And what did it do? It essentially was lifecycle management. Uh, what's there on the slides is on the right-hand side, um, Docker Maven plugin that brings up a component I'm testing against. In this case, a Postgres database was for a different talk. Um, then connecting it with Spring configuration on the left-hand side using some stuff like active profiles. Um, that worked quite well, actually, with a couple of downsides, because if that integration test would fail, even though I'm using the fail-safe Maven plugin, the stuff that only runs um, after all unit test runs, it happens that resources are not properly shut down. It made my life really better, but it did not, it was not enough. However, if you dig up the slides, this is not useless knowledge, quite the opposite. I find that approach, uh, Maven failsafe plugin or anything that's familiar on Gradle, um, quite useful for testing stuff on the module path. Is anyone writing software on the module path these days in this room? One. Wow, that's, that's few. Uh, but you, you're the Heligon, Heligon person. Excellent. Um, yeah, our stuff is module path compatible as well, and I want to test that on the module path, and then these shy things I'm going to show don't work that quite well, so I'm using the external approach. Right? In different scenarios, when I want to um, uh, test an actual feature that would defy the need for those integration tests, then I cannot use it. Then that's the second point. Um, when I want to test an external service, right? 
the, the funny error messages uh, I copy and pasted in there is actually two weeks old. It's my JDK. I can stop it from speaking German for whatever reason because a colleague was actually running into this issue. So if you have these kind of things, follow those links. Um, I think it's quite helpful. As I said, uh, near and dear to my heart, also not dated knowledge, uh, I could keep a track record of question with or problems with embedded testing. So we as Java developers, I think we are quite lucky. There are so many amazing products on the JVM. Think Kafka, think Neo4j, uh, message brokers, ActiveMQ. They all bring embeddable components you can bring up even in production. have seen this as well. Um, maybe not the best idea of all. Um, but you can bring them up in testing. There are wrappers even for things that run not natively on the JVM, like Flapdoodle for MongoDB. So there is a need for these kinds of embedded testing. And of course, I mean, Java is that one piece of ecosystem where standards work quite well, especially JDBC and, and also SQL. Um, it's close enough to replace one big database against an embeddable database, right? Works as well for, for message brokers behind GMS, another Java standard, uh, Java messaging system, or Jakarta these days. So I would use an embedded approach because there's no or little infrastructure required. Runs all on the same JVM. It has brilliant locality. You don't step onto other developers' feet, right? Uh, it's one process. Of course, you can shoot your own feet anytime soon by writing bad tests. Uh, tests that are data dependent cannot run at the same time, for example, if it's the same data. But it's nice. Also, the performance is oftentimes better than bringing up a whole different external system in a container. Not always, sometimes. And there's that one special case where you want to test something that runs in your product, like a Neo4j store procedure written in Java. I can directly push it into the system and test it there without having to repackage everything. Not to embed, yeah, because coupling. Um, all these components I mentioned, at least Neo4j, for example, is pretty tied to a Java or JDK version. So if you use this in testing, embedded testing, you tie your application's version to the thing you use for testing, which is most likely a bad idea. If you run this in production embedded, then you tied everything, right? Dependency is properly real, right? Especially these days, still today, with Java X and Jakarta EE dependencies. And in generally, you might not testing any, everything you want, like latency, network latency, traffic size, um, network interaction, possible retries. I mean, if there's a network in between, um, failures are inevitable. You need to be prepared for that. And eventually, just because there is an abstraction X, um, that doesn't even mean that the query language is syntactically fully compatible or even semantically, right? Uh, so you might having green tests without any value because you substituted the thing you actually wanted to test. So I'm going to show you a quick demo for the case not to embed. And I'm switching to my IntelliJ here. I'm going to share the repository with you uh, after the talk. So what I'm looking at is a quite dated Spring Boot application, 2.7 on Java 11. Seems to be old. Um, I can show you that there are many applications out there still on 11 or older. It's depending on the Neo4j Java driver, um, Spring Boot test framework, and an older version of Neo4j in the test scope. I'm skipping the whole Spring Data stuff here. It's not interest to this talk. I created a super simple repository that creates movies inside our database. So creates a movie, and uh, that's how a merge statement looks in Cypher. And finally, there are tests for this stuff. At Spring Boot test, it's a good indicator that this stuff is an integration test, usually. And what we have here is an embedded Neo4j and this is how you would start an embedded Neo4j with a um, builder method, and you just run it. 
Here in this case, I'm already using something that uh, still is not all that widely used, the uh, dynamic property registry of Spring. So you can just um, alter any properties after the fact, and you don't have specific profiles. I personally find that much better than what we used to have back in, I don't know, it's, I think it was Spring Boot 2.1 or 2.2 when they introduced it. Quite helpful. The rest is just normal lifecycle management before all and after all statement and then the actual test which I'm going to run now. And we stick to this example for all the Spring stuff. So what we're seeing here, it's beautiful. It already fails. Um, yeah, the reason for that is I think I checked out the wrong version. So going back to that one. Remember your brothers in the winery? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I can make it easily bigger. So let's run it again. Still failing. No. I think I'm on the wrong. JDK, I mean, I'm already making my own point here. It's quite hard to demonstrate. Um, just going to refresh the build. I had a green build moments ago. Anyhow, that's just brilliant. What I'm looking at is already a linkage error. I think I'm running this test on the wrong Java version. So Neo4j 4 is Java 11. I think I'm still bringing up 17 here for whatever reason I cannot get behind at the moment. And if I would try to upgrade things here, for example, let's go to 17. That's what I wanted to show and Spring Boot 3.1. I would need to bump the module settings here, go to 17. I guess I was running with 17 the whole time. So we get the exception we've seen before. Um, you tied your testing against the product you want to test. If I try it the other way around, getting uh, a newer Neo4j version into it, 5 something, it's Java 17 based. So the combination should actually work. Try this again. I got a bunch of jetty messages look, look, looking not too bad initially, but eventually failing with uh, some terrible stack trace um, about a no class that found error. These are the things you get when you try to tie in a big component into another, like big component spring is big as well. You have dependency um, clashes here in that case, Neo4j embedded web server clashes with the stuff that spring is using. You could try to fix this with a version that is used to work with, I think, 5.10, had a compatible version, and eventually you get a green build. But that's, that's not how things are supposed to do, right? That would work now, but the next upgrade would be similar painful. So I'm just checking out the next step, and then go back to the presentation. So what we've seen is that if you try to embed things, you, you're kind of screwed. So test containers, the whale in the room. Test containers is for me not, not a framework, it's a library which actually codifies the lifecycle management we've seen in the, in the old days, right? It's a, then a wrapper for real services running in containers. So to be able to use test containers, you have two options. You need to have Docker locally installed on your machine, or you can use the offering from Atomic Jar. These days, it belongs to Docker Inc. running test containers in the cloud. I think it has a beautiful API for accessing and manage everything that's running in the containers, including the ability to start up multiple containers at once, connecting their network and making them speak to each other, which is highly valuable if you run tests against cluster. So it then couples the life cycle of this container to the life cycle of your test. That's basically all. In a before test, it starts all the required services, reconfigures the stuff, and then you run a test. 
after the test, and that's it's a very important point. It safely cleans up your resources, regardless of the way you build, regardless if you use Maven, Failsafe, or Gradle, or whatever. It's that library that takes care of it. And that is a part of that guy. It's Ryuk, uh, Japanese uh, god of death, which usually takes notes of people's name in a book and puts them to bed. Um, it's not that harsh in test containers. Um, he sticks around, takes a note of what containers were brought up, and kills them. Um, that's, that's the second container image you see when you do a Docker PS after using test containers. There will always be Ryuk. Um, I added that slide uh, relatively on short notice because I thought, well, just because I'm a database guy, there's more to it. Everything that we're going to see in a second uh, can be applied to other interesting topics, like if you, for to example, test against AWS, you don't always have to use AWS or GCP. There are modules for that as well. They work all the same like the database models. There's also, as already mentioned, uh, LLM models and modules for that quite helpful uh, for building your local stack for, for anything generally. So right back into the demo. So I already checked out a newer version of um, my project, still on 2.7, but importing the test container bomb for those of who, who don't know this, uh, these builds of materials are quite helpful if you're using stuff that comes with a bunch of modules, different modules, and maybe in different versions. These bombs manage them for you. It's only one version you have to take care of, and then you can where is it? just use that one piece here without any version. That's, that's quite helpful. So what we see now in the repository test, the repository under test is exactly the same. Is first of all an annotation um, at test containers that I always put in there, at least in our open source projects. I want people to be able to contribute even if they don't have Docker installed locally. What it does, it just skips the test if you have, don't have Docker. The Neo4j instance here is not anymore a Neo4j embedded version, but the test containers module. The start here looks surprisingly the same. It's, the builder has different names, but it's just names. What it does here is I pick one image, the 4.4 version, to stay in, in the context in the story. I wait for Bolt. Bolt is not the dog uh, from, the, from the movie, nor, nor any lightning. It's, it's a protocol that Neo4j uses under the hood. And then I set the reuse flag. So you don't have to do this, but this is quite helpful when dealing with performance. You can tell Ryok not to take a note and keep that container around. So this is helpful that you don't have to restart these things up. Same approach with the dynamic property sources, reconfiguring the framework, and hopefully things work now as intended on the first try. So there is a gazillion lines of log um, because test containers logs to the uh, log4j and by default it's not managed and you get all the debugging stuff you don't really care about most of the time and we get to this in a second. Eventually the spring test runs, connection works, um, that's how it should be. In the next step I can safely upgrade to a newer version of Neo4j, for example, the version of 5.13 that did not work due to dependency clashes before. Test runs. It's also quite quickly. And, um, it tells me, at this case, I could not find the reuse reusable container. That's the reason for that is I used a different image before. If I run it a second time, it should be way faster. It's milliseconds now instead of a minute. And it tells me it's reusing an existing container. Quite good stuff, I think. 
So we will leave the Spring ecosystem for a second at this point. And um, oh, oh yes, before we leave, how does that help me as a library developer? And how does it help me with my test matrix? For example, I can configure the image name via um, system properties, setting them by default in my build script so that it works out of the box, and then co reconfigure them on CI via properties, different profiles. I already told you about the reuse flag that makes it quite a bit faster. If you have a lot of tests, uh, you only have to make sure that you have data independent tests for each other. Um, it's quite easy to provide an extension to JUnit that skips incompatible versions, so we don't have images for, for the old versions of the database that run on ARM64. Of course, all of our modern products run on ARM64. Um, that really made my life a lot easier. Of course, well, this is a bit small, I'm sorry about that. Um, it's also super easy to generate a um, argument source for, for JUnit, which you then can feed into test containers, um, like in line 59 in that listing. So if you, if you master that way to, to deal with these image names, your test matrixes become a breeze, really. What I had before was a mixture of profiles in Maven um, plus big setup in our CI that was at one point really unmaintainable. Doing this via profiles helps a lot. So new challengers entered, entered the grid. Um, I really forgot which of the fighters was new in Street Fighter II. I think one of the Asian women was new, but doesn't matter. Um, Quarkus, initially released in 2019. The fun fact is I was always super attached to the Spring ecosystem. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book about it. But as a vendor, I'm pretty interested that we as Neo4j are on this platform. And uh, we work together quite closely with the Red Hat team on that. And yeah, Quarkus has two focuses. One is fast startup time focusing on container deployment. Of course, original Spring Boot was focused on packaging and deployment as well, but think about it. Spring Boot was released in 2014. Back then, a fat jar file was all the rage and not so much the container approach. Five years later, in 2019, this was different. And also, the Red Hat guys and girls could take a different approach to annotation processing. Do we always have to do this on runtime, or can we do this on build time? Can we shift more stuff to the build time? That was Quarkus' approach and the breath of fresh air. Also, they had the focus of developer joy, thinking about hmm, batteries included, so that you just can code on. They call this continuous coding or something. Anyway, I really enjoyed um, working together. Got three t-shirts, which was nice. And yeah, I'm going to show what we, what we build. Um, I'm focusing on the developer joy here, not on, on the native uh, stuff with GraalVM and all of that. It's, this is for another talk. So what, what Quarkus added was something that existed quite a long time ago. So if you look at their configuration files, you sometimes see percentage, percentage test and percentage prod. Those are predefined profiles in Quarkus for, well, obviously, test and production. And without a prefix, it's just the default. This is quite well known, for example, in the Ruby on Rails world. They had this back in 2005 or something. But you know how this is. These things repeat after a while. Without test containers, though, that approach, or without managed components, it suffers from the same things like passing around at persistence XML, right? You will hard code your credentials and your URLs in there, which is not so much joy. And what we're going to see in a demo here is um, how a Quarkus integration test and developer service can run. So going to that one, need to use that one. So this is straight uh, from our Neo4j OGM integration with Quarkus. 
it's, it's, my, it's our own integration tests here. Um, what I'm dependent on is the Neo4j OGM Quarkus module and the Quarkus J unit test. Nothing else, actually. That's the batteries included approach and maybe an approach that is debatable. But let's come to this in a second. I can run MVN Quarkus dev. And if these things now work as intended, it should bring up a Neo4j container on my behalf. You can just read it here, the last line, and now it's up and running. And um, I could access the application. So Quarkus comes with a built-in developer UI, and it shows you what it started. It brought up this Neo4j instance, helpfully prints me the URL. I can speak to it. The generated password is very hard. It's password. And what you're looking now at is not a Quarkus application. That's the Neo4j backend. Um, you can also access now the endpoints, like the list of movies. If I do so, um, the container is, of course, empty. Just was brought up. can generate some data. This is um, built in into our product so that you have some test data. Creates a graph, quite nice um, to interact with, and you can do all this. Um, the, the demo and the project is online, and then the service actually can return stuff. Batteries included approach. How does it work? I have a repository here as well, movie repository. It's a bit different because it uses our object mapping. Details does not matter in that case. Um, and what it's running now is the whole application. There's one integration test here, but you don't see anything in there that brings up a Neo4j container. This is done with the dev developer services from Quarkus. So in contrast to Common Belief, where Quarkus and Red Hat people and somebody, some, some people say it's all always explicit when not using Spring, it's, it's not the case. Um, they choose a very implicit way of working with these things. If you have Docker installed, if you have defined the database connection, they bring up a database or message broker, what have you for you. I'm using Neo4j here works the same as Postgres. It brings stuff up on your behalf. This is quite nice for doing live coding like this and also for developing, but not always what you want. You might have a local database running on your machine. You're not aware, you forgot about it. You start a test and the test does not bring up the container on your behalf, but just uses what's there and maybe your production data is done but your mileage may vary. It's, it's something like everything else that needs to be used consciously. So we've been there with the managed test containers in Quarkus. Again, it's good stuff needs to be used consciously. There's more to it. So they have a programmatic ap approach, which they call the Quarkus Test Resource Lifecycle Manager, quite a mouthful, so it's not only the Spring classes that are long, but I'm German, I love them, it's no, no worries. Uh, it can enhance uh, the environment similar to Spring Boot's dynamic properties, and there's an API for connecting containers directly. It's super nice to building cluster applications, stuff like this. And eventually, um, Back to Spring Boot. Um, so the flaming Hadouken was added in Street Fighter 2. This was new. Um, this week or last week, Spring Boot 3.3 was released. So that number on the slide is already dated. But 3.1 introduced managed test containers dependencies in Spring Boot. So we don't have to need to pull on this dependency management anymore. And they also worked on the logging so that you don't get all these logs in your face, which I find super helpful, especially on CI, so that I don't have to take care of cleaning up those logs. There's, new, there's a new interface, the connection details. It's a plain and empty interface. It's just a marker for a generic contract that points to anything running in a container or on a different system, right? 
Um, there are enhancements for uh, implementations for JDBC, bunch of dedicated relational databases, Neo4j, Kafka, and Cassandra. Of course, there's a new annotation. The add service connection in Spring Boot 3.1 and higher brings the test containers into your Spring context. And then again, a more full augmented main classes. And for once, the Spring framework people got very explicit actually, and way more explicit than, than Quarkus. Let's have a look at this. Um, I think I'm going to just skip over that image and show you in code. So I'm leaving the Quarkus demonstration right now, and I'm getting the latest version of my demo, which I updated last week or so, just prior to 3.3, and I'm not going to change this now as we speak. So what's missing here is the import of the bill of materials from, from test containers, right? I only have the Spring Boot Starter test, the Neo4j, um, sorry, the JUnit Jupyter test containers module, and eventually a concrete implementation. When I jump over to the repository test, it's essentially empty now. It fits on the, the whole class fits into one screen and it's just runnable. Let's see if I did not make too much promises. And what I see here is, is quite beautiful. I see test containers information, locked on info, super nice. Um, using test containers desktop, I could log into my containers from their application. Um, some relevant information from where an image comes, and that's about it. Um, I also got the information that it's reusing a container and I see only the relevant pieces. I like that improvement in the latest Spring Boot versions a lot. Um, there's only the test class, but here's the, the, the main change. It contains an imported um, configuration class, and I can jump into this. And what we see here is test configuration, specific test configuration, and then standard Spring at bean plus at service connection, returning a new Neo4j container. And in the Spring world, this is tied to a connection details looking connection details. Um, as, as, as I promise, it's an empty interface. Oh, downloading sources worked out of the box. That's nice. And jumping to the Neo4j one. So the methods in here are the basic stuff that comes out of the box with Spring Boot. You could overwrite it, you could run your own stuff, but these things are automatically instantiated when you bring a service connection like this with a known container. That's everything. You don't need to pester with the properties anymore, it just works. It even takes this thing into account. So season spring application developers know that beans usually have a life cycle as well, and they are t um, torn down after usage. Um, these beans are also, of course, torn down after usage, but they won't stop the container. If I would remove this and run it again, it will increase in runtime from a roughly half a second to about a minute or so, I guess. So it's very well thought of and integrated. So it, yeah, it, was, it was a bit more than a second, not a minute. Addressing the um, developer joy, I have a test application right in test scope here. So during development, and of course, uh, we write test thirds, but it's a lie. Many of us just sit down, hack away stuff, and that's the reason why the dev services in Quarkus is so popular. We can have this in Spring Boot as well. So we can tell a Spring application created from any application main class, and as usually I try to leave this quite empty, 
is created and it's augmented with that specific service connection here and it then runs. In this demo, I don't have a web endpoint or something. I just have this application that connects to Neo4j, verifies connectivity, prints out a line, and is, is done. Right? If I would not augment this application, this verification will immediately fail with an exception. So, but that's not, that's not the point here. The point in here being is the explicitness. Um, I'm a big fan of, of keeping these two here, main and test, separately. And from my perspective, that development services really belongs into testing. It's not something you, or at least I want to have on the main class path. I l really dig this approach. It's, it's great. You can have this in main if you want, of course. But I would rather scratch my eyes out than to have this on main. Actually, that is terrible. So that would be necessary if you want to have these augmented classes on main and just don't go there. I think that's all I have from the demo and I can go back to my recap. So over the last more than 10 years, uh, for me, containers made it quite easy to test the real thing. And this is still a necessity, at least from my point of view. I want to provide good object mapping framework, good drivers for our, our database. Test containers uh, bring essentially life cycle management. Reusable test containers mitigate any startup penalty. And frameworks across the bank pick this up. This applies to Spring, to Quarkus, to Micronaut, and Helidon as well. And um, yeah, last but not least, I think what's important here is, is uh, the mutual respect and inspiration across the Java ecosystem, which I'm one of the biggest fan of because it's unique uh, and, and we should be thankful for it to some extent. Yeah, that's, that's all I have. Thank you so far. And uh, I think we have about five minutes for questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay, you find me in the hallway having some coffee if you want to chat. Feel free to say hello. Thanks. <laughs>